Welcome to History Talk, the history podcast for everyone, produced by Origins, Current Events, and Historical Perspective. This is your co-host, Patrick Payandi, and our topic today is what does it mean to be a public intellectual? For those who read The Atlantic, The New York Times, or Politico recently, this has been the topic du jour of late. Hello, and this is your other co-host, Leticia Wiggins. So first, I read a piece by Nicholas Kristof when he took up the topic in The New York Times, writing, Professors, we need you. So he claimed academics were not doing enough to engage and shape the public sphere. The Facebook pages of graduate students here at Ohio State's History Department blew up in response. And a week afterward, the Times printed a string of letters from prominent academics who took issue with Kristoff. So I thought this was a great topic to explore for today's show. And so then in January, Tana Hesse Coates, a writer for The Atlantic, called Melissa Harris Perry, quote, America's foremost public intellectual. Almost immediately, Dylan Byers of Politico responded via Twitter and then his blog by questioning Coates' quote, intellectual cred. So our show today takes on this tangled topic. We're asking academics, public intellectuals, and a few who straddle both worlds just what is a public intellectual anyway. We'll also explore the ways academics engage with the public from teaching to writing for a popular audience. We'll even question the value of public intellectual ideal itself. So stay tuned. Patrick spoke to our first guest via phone about academics and the label of the public intellectual. Hi, uh, my name is Stanley Fish, uh, and I am a uh, professor of law, both at Cardozo Law School in New York and at Florida International University uh, Law School in Miami. All right, Professor Fish, thank you for joining us today on History Talk. Let's jump right to it. How do you define a public intellectual? Well, I think that my definition of a public intellectual would be largely negative, uh, because there is no school uh, to which you might go in order to become one. There are no certificates of validation that identify you as one. There are no courses in becoming a public intellectual. So I guess I'd give uh, a definition like this. Uh, Someone is a public intellectual if he or she somehow, by any number of routes, Uh, comes to the notice of the public in a way that makes him or her the possible repository of wisdom, uh, or at least of insight, on many topics. Do you see that wisdom, as you call it, do you see that as kind of different from something along the lines of expertise? Well, I think that uh, public intellectuals, insofar as they constitute a population, are regarded uh, as having expertise. Uh, Insofar as those who are are identified as public intellectuals come from the academy, it's impossible for them to have the range of expertise that is implied by the number of topics they're willing to talk about. Because one of the things that marks a public intellectual uh, is someone uh, who is not simply Uh, an expert in a narrow uh, area of, let's say, academic study, but someone who uh, has the authority somehow, and that, of course, is the question, where does this authority uh, come from, to pronounce uh, on many matters, not only across a range of academic disciplines, but across a range of problems that uh, are facing the world in general. And so building on that idea, what made you pursue a professional path that included work as a public intellectual? Well, of course, I did not. Public intellectualism, if I may, if I may commit a barbarism, uh, public intellectualism is an accidental occupation. Uh, you don't aspire to it because there are no steps by which you could uh, succeed and be uh, recognized in some uh, official way. Uh, It just happens to you, or it doesn't. I see. And so the debate, given the debate that's been going on about public intellectuals in the New York Times and the Atlantic, among other places, do you believe that academics do enough to engage the broader public? Uh, Depending on whether you're asking the question from the point of view of the academy or from the point of view of the general good of the public. From the point of view of the general good of the public, it would probably be useful if more academics uh, paid attention to uh, current affairs and made themselves uh, available for commentary. But if, in fact, you are an academic whose interests are largely in pursuing your disciplinary subject, then I believe you have no obligation whatsoever uh, to become someone 
uh, who comments on matters in public forums. Have you found your work with um, with engaging the broader public rewarding? Yes, I have. Um, that is, it it uh, moves me to a kind of writing that is not the kind of writing I usually engage in. It puts me in touch with a number of a large number of persons who respond instantly to uh, what I'm writing when I write, for example, in the New York Times. Whereas, uh, as as you know, when you publish an academic book, it will be a year uh, after you have submitted the book before it is published. It will be another year or a year and a half before you begin to see uh, any reviews. Whereas when I wrote a column for the New York Times and it came out on a Tuesday morning, uh, by late Tuesday afternoon, uh, I could have anywhere from 200 to 400 uh, comments and uh, many more, uh, as the Times calls them, hits on its website. And so just to wrap up, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we end? If I could be autobiographical for a moment. I of became, course. Uh, what, uh, I became what some people call a public intellectual. It's never an identification that I would name for mine. I became an, uh, a, a, a public intellectual in some people's eyes because of the culture wars, because I spoke out at a certain moment when I was at Duke University and made some remarks uh, per, uh, relative, re, relative, relative to the culture wars that were picked up by the media. That then led me to be invited to appear on some radio and TV programs uh, where those culture war issues were then being debated. And once you get into the Rolodex, uh, of course there are no more Rolodexes, but once you get into what used to be the Rolodex of uh, uh, media outlets, uh, news programs, you are there forever, and you can uh, be confident that someone will be calling you up to solicit your opinion. But again, it was all accidental. That's the point that I really want to emphasize. Uh, it was all accidental, and it just happened to me, and it could have just as easily not happened to me, and it could have just as easily happened to a thousand other people. Once again, Professor Fish, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Leticia caught up with our second guest, again by phone, for a lively conversation. My name is Tom Segura. I'm professor of history and sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, where I also direct the Penn Social Science and Policy Forum. Um, I'm a historian of 20th century United States. I work on urban history, public policy, political history, the history of civil rights. We're going to start straight off the bat with a question of how do you define a public intellectual a public intellectual is uh, a term that uh, I think needs to be defined fairly broadly, um, but, but I would uh, include under that rubric academics or uh, writers, folks who are involved in the life of the mind who make it a high commitment to engage the general public with the uh, work that they're doing, uh, to reach out through any variety of different media, through the press, by doing interviews, by writing for a general audience, for speaking to the general public, uh, for um, working um, for organizations that present scholarship to in an accessible way to mm -hmm. um, wider audiences, whether that be through museums or through community organizations. I would also put under that rubric intellectuals who use their skills or expertise to assist social movements or organizations working for social or political change or engaging in the political process. Do you believe that academics do enough to engage the broader public? And you note this in your letter to the editor, I think, was, was written in response to the Nicholas Kristof piece in the New York Times. But why do you think others aren't necessarily seeing these scholarly contributions that you were able to so clearly define? Well, I think Nicholas Kristof has a very narrow definition of public intellectual. That is, he's looking to a handful of mostly well-connected white male intellectuals mm -hmm. who were serving like Arthur Schlesinger as a, you know, a kind of a, a court historian to the Kennedy administration, um, or intellectuals like, say, Irving Howe, who reached a wide audience um, and was involved in the 
creation and, and expansion of Dissent magazine. I mean, they're, they're the quintessential public intellectuals. There are lots of ways of being a public intellectual, and running a little magazine or uh, whispering into the ear of the president are a small subset of the dozens and dozens of academics. I mean, I could give you a long list of mm-hmm. folks who are involved in working with prisoners, giving TED Talks, speaking to community organizations, testifying before Congress, uh, serving as ex- expert witnesses in court cases, uh, working for museums. Uh, I, those are just a few, you know, really the tip of, of, of the iceberg. Looking online when we were trying to formulate this show to see who considers who the top public intellectuals, there is this piece, I think, from Foreign Policy listing about 20 public intellectuals and hardly any were listed as women. And to have an evenness of perspective and voice on the show, it's really been difficult to to contact women. And some of those who we've contacted have cited an ambition gap in a way. And I didn't know if you had any comment on this uh, or if you'd say with your broader definition, we could encapsulate more women or minorities or different activists under this public intellectual category? Oh, I think there are a lot of women who are working as public intellectuals in the way that I defined. I mean, I, I can just, you know, I can think of a few. Uh, Heather Thompson, mm-hmm. uh, who works on um, prison and incarceration and its history, is writing a book on Attica right now, but she speaks all the time to community organizations, to public groups, to general audiences. Or I think of uh, Lisa Levenstein uh, at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, who's been very active in providing intellectual support for the folks who are challenging the um, North Carolina's laws regarding uh, welfare and work. And I can think of Eileen Boris and Jennifer Klein. Eileen is at Santa Barbara. Jennifer is at Yale, both of whom have written for general audiences about care work and about women working in the um, insecure private sector. They're all stepping mm-hmm. into some of the most important debates in the country. So looking at those who kind of reach out to the community and then also those who do write for other scholars, that knowledge advances when scholars write for other scholars. So I'm trying to think if there's a way to write for other scholars, but also the broader public, or if that's necessary, if it's okay to say that an intellectual can be an intellectual for the intellectual's sake. Well, I think um, it's it's important to pr- pr- present detailed research, um, specialized scholarship to audiences of specialists, because um, you know a lot of what professors do, even in fields that seem to have direct application to current problems like medicine or biological sciences, you know, are are still highly technical and aren't necessarily in the first case going to be accessible to the general public. But there are all sorts of ways that we can present our work to a wider audience. Many of us who teach, for example, are presenting Mm -hmm. um, a distillation of our scholarship to our students. Many folks, especially in my subfield of 20th century U.S. history, write op-eds or um, many of us speak to church groups, neighborhood organizations, uh, and present our findings in a much more accessible way, almost like we're teaching to a, a general public rather than um, simply um, talking to each other at our disciplines conferences. So I think there are all sorts of ways that um, you can be faithful to the rigor, the detail, the specificity, and the specialization of your scholarship, but also make it accessible. Before we end, is there anything else you'd like to add or advice for those who want to do their best and are looking to be a public intellectual? I think if you're a young academic and you're um, looking to get tenure at an institution, you do have to balance the demands of your department and um, your scholarly production with your um, reaching out to a wider audience. But I don't see any reason why you can't begin even at an early stage in your career to do both so long as you don't cross over and spend too much time mm-hmm. writing for a general public and lose sight of what your university requires. I think more and more of us, especially mid-career and younger scholars, are sympathetic uh, to folks coming up through the tenure pipeline who uh, want their scholarship to be relevant and want to engage the world beyond the academy. And uh, speaking for myself, um, if you do first-rate scholarship and you engage the world, that would be a plus factor uh, (laughs) if I were on your tenure committee.
Leticia was all over this episode, so she traveled to the office of a well-known military historian and academic at Ohio State who regularly engages the public via several platforms. I'm Professor Peter Monsoor, the General Raymond E. Mason Jr. Chair of Military History at The Ohio State University. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Mansour. And I just may kind of start right off the bat with a question that really started us looking at this show or thinking about this show is, how would you define a public intellectual? I think a a public intellectual is someone who engages people uh, in a manner that can be readily understood by a, a generally informed audience, but not necessarily specialists in any given field. With this definition, would you consider yourself to be, then, a public intellectual? Yes. Actually, I engage the American people in a variety of ways, in print, uh, on radio. And so I uh, have, obviously, uh, specialty areas in military history and and military affairs, given my my Army background. Uh, But I try to do so uh, when I speak to the public or write for the public in ways that the, the American people can understand. Is there a special thing you keep in mind when you're going through and writing for this general public? Um, well, you have to put yourself in, in, the, in the shoes of, of the, the reader or the listener. I love the scene from the movie Armageddon, for instance. This is mm-hmm. an old movie, but uh, <laughs> you know, they're saving the world. They're on this, this asteroid is heading for the planet, and uh, the NASA scientists are meeting with the president. And the president asks a question. He goes, well, how, how large is it? And the NASA scientist starts talking about how many square kilometers and how much weight and this and that. And he's clearly not getting through. And the the director of NASA interrupts and goes, Mr. President, it's the size of Texas. (laughs) That's that's the difference between (laughs) between an academic specialist and a public intellectual. (laughs) (laughs) And kind of moving back into this, this engagement with the public. So you were recently on Reddit AMA. Um, Would you mind telling a little bit about what that is and then your experience doing that? Well, uh, Reddit is a website that is very um, popular, especially with young people. And uh, they call themselves the front page of the Internet. Anyone can post uh, things on Reddit and then they get up and down voted. uh, But they have this uh, special arrangement called Ask Me Anything or AMA. You can do one just on your own, but uh, it's best to arrange one ahead of time if you have some sort of appeal to the audience. And and I wrote in and at my kids uh, urging (laughs) and they said, dad, you need to do an AMA. So I said, what's that? And I learned about, I I read some of them there. They're archived. Um, You know, Bill Gates has done one in the past and Barack Obama and various other people. So I, I arranged one and it, and it basically started off. I'm, I'm Colonel retired Peter R. Monsoor, formerly executive officer to General David Petraeus in Iraq during the surge of 2007-2008, and now a professor of military history at The Ohio State University. Ask me anything. People started posting questions, and I started uh, typing in answers. Now, normally AMAs go for about two hours, but I, I went ahead and did it for about eight hours. So I had a very thorough interchange of ideas with the people who wrote in. There were far more questions than I could answer. I mean, it's amazing the number of people who write in. People up and down vote these questions, and the more popular ones then go higher on on the website, uh, and those are the ones that you, you want to address. And, and they, arra- they ranged everywhere from uh, what I think about uh, the Iraq war to, uh, you know, what do I think about Edward Snowden and the NSA revelations to what's my best life advice <laughs> uh, to, uh, to young people. And, and um, you know, it was, it, was, it was pretty entertaining, actually. With those exchanges, um, you said you had this range of questions did you kind of learn also from, from these different dialogue that was going on? I learned what interests um, many young people today just by the questions they asked. And uh, on some of them, they were terribly ill-informed. On others, they were as well-informed or better than, than me. Do you think your military background lends a different aspect to your role, I guess, as a public intellectual? Uh, it does. Um, the various uh, media outlets that have me on say, how do you want to be identified? Right. And my standard answer is Colonel Retired Peter Monsoor, uh, formerly Executive Officer to General David Petraeus during the Iraq War, and now a Professor of Military History at The Ohio State University. So I have this sort of unique double identity as a professor and as a uh, long-serving military officer with experience at the various high, highest levels of making uh, military policy and strategy. And 
And that has allowed me to talk about not just military history, which is my academic field, but to talk about current events. And um, what I've been told by the media is they like having me on because uh, not only do I have the expertise, but I can put things in terms that the American people can understand rather right. than speaking in uh, army ease or military mm-hmm. jargon. Public intellectual. Very few people, I think, use that title when saying, well, what do you do? I'm a public intellectual. And I wonder if it's kind of a dead term or... I think well, very few people use it because very few, few people are public intellectuals. Most university professors would not identify themselves as a public intellectual just because they don't play in that arena. And should they? Well, okay. that was the whole purpose, the of, the whole piece, purpose of the piece, that, right? that America needs the, the voices of its most educated and talented people speaking up on public issues. And for a variety of reasons, they often don't. You know, one, it's work. And uh, and two, sometimes the, even if they put work into an op-ed or something like that, it doesn't get published because they don't have the gravitas uh, in the, the American mainstream press to get noticed. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, you got to try. You, you can't win unless you try. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can't play unless you're in the arena. You know, that's what I would just say that... I I kind of agreed with his piece that we do need uh, more voices from academia speaking out on, on issues of the present day. And in our final segment, Patrick interviewed a historian who recently earned her PhD and has already been engaging the public sphere left and right. I'm Jessica Adler, currently a visiting researcher at Tufts University, and I'll be starting work in August at Florida International University in Miami as an assistant professor in the Department of History and the Department of Health Policy and Management. And my current book project is about the beginning of the U.S. veterans' health system in the interwar years, and I'm generally interested in the history of U.S. health policy. Thanks for joining us today. And so you recently earned your Ph.D., and you've already been engaging the public via writing and interviews. Tell us a little bit about that. To be clear, my experience with this sort of work is so far, you know, it's in its very early stages. Um, Definitely. But but I do think that early career historians and academics in general in this age of kind of information inundation are really in a position to be pretty much as public as they want to be. So I decided to pursue the study of history like like many, many other people who do the same because I wanted to understand complicated and pervasive contemporary problems. And I think our discipline from that respect really lends itself to public intellectual work. You know, 10 years ago, I was a reporter for a daily newspaper in Patterson, New Jersey, and I was lucky enough to be assigned to the health beat. And one issue that really interested me was exactly this idea of healthcare access in the United States. And I hoped to understand it better by looking at the backstory of how and why some populations like soldiers and veterans won the privilege of government sponsored medical care. And really, I think that the most challenging thing that historians do is to use evidence that we've searched out, that we've rescued from oblivion in order to draw big and detailed pictures, basically to use this study and this discussion of history to understand and explain power dynamics, human relations, political and economic systems, and big societal questions and problems. And I think if we can draw from our research some connections with issues of common concern to lots of people, then we can pretty readily engage with the public. And sometimes, nowadays, the trick is finding a public or a media outlet like History Talk or like Origins that actually cares to listen, or to just really have, I guess, the guts to put your thoughts out there on your own via a blog or by pursuing writing and speaking engagements that are kind of, you know, outside the academic comfort zone. That's really well said. I love the story of how you came to study history and and, and how you're engaging the public. Um, So some argue that academics are under no professional obligation to engage the public. So why do you? Well, the, the work that I've done in the interviews I've had in the more public realm, like, for example, talking about the closing of Walter Reed Hospital a few years ago, mm-hmm. and talking about the Affordable Care Act in relation to the history of veterans' health. Right. Those experiences have really helped me to think, to think more clearly about my historical questions and to think more broadly about their 
potential larger implications. So, for example, instead of just thinking about what was going on in political, social, and public health worlds in the World War I era, so I'm really trying to draw links to other time periods, other issues that may be familiar and um, that may matter to a lot of people. So that, for me, is a really challenging intellectual exercise, and I think, but it's a challenging thing to make links and connections to contemporary problems without being, you know, what we all call presentist, without reading current perspectives back onto the past and right. to use the past in order instead to enrich the view of the present. But I do want to say that I think it's interesting that all of these conversations that are happening about public intellectuals and the responsibility of academics don't focus very much on the art of teaching and what is going on in classrooms. You know, in my opinion, anyone who teaches history has to do what we're talking about here, has to do what publicly engaged academics do for the general public, make it clear that they're disciplined, that their topic of study is relevant, that it can help people understand, you know, very important questions. And so, you know, I really think that every time a history professor teaches a survey class and makes broad and, in my opinion, rightful claims about the usefulness of the craft of history to a large group of students who are probably going to go on to study business or biology, Mm -hmm. but that professor is really acting as a public intellectual. It's that a lot of creative energy goes into making the classroom a place where students can use history in order to debate and exchange ideas about, about current concerns and what could be more publicly engaging than that. That's that's a really excellent point about teaching that you're making. And I'm, I want to build on what you're saying here and ask you, have there been any difficulties seen or unforeseen um, about engaging the public that you want to highlight? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the arguments that Nicholas Kristof brought up in his Times piece um, are valid, that people who live in the academic world are sort of barricaded off and sometimes unwittingly because universities have very distinct requirements for professors who are seeking tenure. Right. And that those requirements don't necessarily jibe with publishing in the popular press. Um, I do think that some of that is changing and that a lot of universities do value and do reward some faculty members who attempt to engage with the public. But I also think that the challenge goes the other way, that You know, when I first went back to school, um, I promised myself that I would always write like a journalist, that I would never use arcane language, Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't couch my historical accounts in a bunch of, you know, fancy jargon. Right. In some ways, academic training in graduate school, where we are exposed to a seemingly infinite array of beautiful and intricate ideas and knowledge, that training makes it very difficult to just sit down and, you know, write a 600-word piece and tell a simple story. So I think the challenge really becomes how to concisely convey ideas that a lot of people can understand when there is so much compelling knowledge out there. So a final question for you. Has the work been rewarding? Yeah, I'll say that, you know, beyond... um, writing for for different sorts of outlets and beyond doing interviews, one thing that I've really tried to do over the last um, few months is to meet with veterans of more recent wars, to go into organizations like the American Legion and um, tell people about my project and try to meet with them and do oral histories with people and really discuss with them their experiences with the veterans' health system. And for me, it's enormously illuminating to hear about you know, personal impressions of the system that I'm trying to trace and to get people's feedback on some of the big ideas that I'm trying to convey in my book. So public engagement in this way, in my view, can be a way to kind of think through arguments beyond, again, beyond that academic field and try to sound off in in an approachable way. So, yeah, in that way, to me, I very much look forward to talking with people who have nothing to do with academia. And um, that to me is a very rewarding experience. Yeah. Well, Jessica Adler, thank you for joining us today on History Talk. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Finally, we'd like to direct you to our Origins webpage, where we've posted some reactions from Ohio State graduate students to the public intellectual debate. You'll also find links to the articles referenced today. You can find all that at our Connecting History blog at origins.osu.edu. Thanks for joining us today.
This edition of the Origins Podcast History Talk was brought to you by the Public History Initiative and the Goldberg Center in the History Department at The Ohio State University. Our main editors are Steve Kahn and Nicholas Breifogel. Our executive producer is David Staley. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Kothheimer. Our audio editors and co-hosts are Patrick Pachiandi and Leticia Wiggins. Find our podcasts and more at our website, origins.osu.edu, and you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. Thank you for listening.